calculator stuff. Because we are already restricted ourselves, and we don't even think we are. So we're like an ant crawling around on the floor and thinking, man, this is a big world. And it is. It occupies every, it's like learning Linux. It has thousands and thousands of commands. And you can spend your entire life just dicking around with Linux and never learn anything about computing. Right? It, it has the illusion of being something important about computing, but in fact, it's a, it's a kind of a budget of bad ideas. So if you notice that it takes longer to get a document up on the screen now than it used to five years ago. <laughs> in fact, it takes a lot longer to get a document up on the screen now than it did 10 years ago. So Nicholas Negroponte's phrase for this is, Andy giveth, but Bill taketh away. <laughs> Well, that's like getting applauded for saying the devil is not nice. <laughs> Nothing controversial there. So we thought Moore's law was irresistible, but, we've, but Microsoft found a way of damping it. So let me wind up. Lots more interesting things here. But so let's go back to our E. coli for a second. And let's ask Squeak some questions. For instance, how many types of things, Squeak, do you have? Oh, 1,917 classes. How many things? do you have in you that are like subroutines, 16,000 something? These are questions of the system, the op what you call the operating system, all of the things you would call applications, all the things I've shown you, a browser, a chat interface, and a whole bunch of other things. How many bytes of code do you have, Mr. Squeak, in you? Oh, 936K bytes. So it's, it's actually rather large by Xerox PARC standards because <laughs> we wouldn't have been able to run this on our little 256K machines back then. But in fact, here's the other interesting thing is this is the entire group that made Squeak in less than three years. Here we were back last January, and these four guys here did virtually all of the work. We put it out on the web in September 96, and here we are, November 2nd, demo to MIT. So we're just coming up on the third year of development. That's worthwhile pondering. Let me talk about what I consider to be the television model. Step one, you buy the television. Step two, you plug it in. Step three, it works perfectly for the next 10 years. Okay, that's sort of the model people have of television sets. And a fair number of other um, devices. Now the computer <laughs> model with a focus on the Windows edition, um, you buy the computer, you plug it in. Now we're two thirds of the way there. It's just this little step of, it works perfectly for the next 10 years where it's a little bit different. Um, first you have to install service packs one through nine F. And then you install 18 new emergency patches, which came later than 9F. 
and then you find and install seven new device drivers from somewhere and hope that they're, they're the right ones. And then you install the antivirus software, and then you install the anti-spyware software, and then you install the anti-hacker software, and then you install the anti-spam software, and you reboot the computer. Okay. <laughs> but we're not done yet. I just ran out of space on the slide. It doesn't work. So you call the help desk, and you wait on hold for about 30 minutes, typically. And they tell you to reinstall Windows, which is <laughs> what you're trying to do in the first place. Um, and the typical user uh, reaction to this is not good. The New York Times reported not too long ago that 25% of all computer users have actually gotten so angry at the computer, they hit it. Okay? <laughs> Just, you know, like, why doesn't it work? You know? There's this huge problem, which is nobody knew how to build scalable software, or indeed scalable almost anything else, except it looked like the ARPANET was going to scale. And it looked like it was going to scale because it had a message passing architecture, just as the nascent object systems that we're working on. And we had this really good set of examples of the difference between something like System 360. Now, nowadays, you'd fill in Windows 98 or almost any piece of Microsoft software. But basically... Okay, intelligent design, at least as applied to operating systems. Um, we have a microkernel, it's about 15,000 lines of code. It's the only thing that runs in the kernel. Uh, Linux, about 15 million lines of code run in the kernel. In Windows, it's probably above 100 million lines at this point. And any bad line can crash the system, okay? Remember, one bug per thousand lines of code, that's the best anybody's ever done. People have made studies of this stuff, you know. Uh, so, you know, um, you know uh, so if we have 15,000 lines of code, we probably have 15 kernel bugs. And Linux probably has 15,000 kernel bugs, and Windows probably has, you know, 100,000 kernel bugs. And they're not all serious. Some are, you know, spelling error in a message or something, but some of them could be serious, and some are weird race conditions, and, it, you know, it just... You know, human beings write the code and they make mistakes and this stuff is tricky. And operating systems are especially tricky. And the drivers have three to seven times more bugs than the rest of the kernel. And the stuff that everybody, you know, people argue open source is great because people study the code. Everybody studies the memory management code and the page replacement algorithm. Nobody studies, you know, the Epson 2641 printer driver because it's not interesting. But, you know, most of the code is drivers and the drivers are full of bugs. And um, so 70% of the code is drivers. All of these software systems done by hand tools and weak ideas tend to resemble pyramids. That is, they're big garbage dumps that somebody has plastered over with limestone. 